While documenting the lives of those living down and out in London, photojournalist Lanray Feyentola got so caught up in the story that he became homeless himself. He decided to move on to a new project and a new town. Six years on, he's still working on the same story, exhaustively recording the lives of his subjects. Yeah, and you get in the car with them, right? And if, like, you tell them that you just do certain things, and when you get there, if, you know what I mean, they don't like it. Nikki is a working girl, a prostitute. She might go and buy herself a rock, and because she might have things in her mind through her hectic lifestyle, she might want to discuss some of those things with me. I automatically set the tape up. And then um, she generally starts off with something, you know, what's happened to her recently. It's like one night I agreed sex with this fella, yeah? And he was really nice spoken. And he said, do you mind if we go to a place? You know, not where you go, he said, because, you know, I'm scared and I've been done before. So well, I said, yeah. yeah. So I said, OK, he acted really nice, do you know what I mean? Yeah. We got to this place. Um, he locked the doors and that, you know, because he said he'd been robbed. Yeah. And I won't concentrate on another one sat up from the floor. What, what happened? We got raped. But they said I turned him on so much. You know the way I was talking to try and get more money out of him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, out of him. He fucking... They did that. <laughs> the one in the back kept saying, we have to fucking do something with her, you know, we've got a dump her. She's seen his face and everything. I was saying, please don't kill me, I've got kids in. Lanray has spent the last six years documenting a group of drug addicts in Bradford's notorious Manningham district. I suppose I'd done the same amount of drugs that most people do as they grow up, you know, a little bit of cannabis. I mean, most people smoke a bit of cannabis, but I didn't know about that stuff properly, no. Not until I got into this story. You ended up on drugs through what? Through working? Yeah. Were you not, doing drugs? Were you not doing drugs before you started working? No. Of, what, 15? 15 when you started working? Jesus. The full title of my book is Chalices Don't Get High on Your Own Supply. That's a druggy phrase, don't get high on your own supply. And, and that's exactly what I did do, if you know what I mean. I, I, I was too arrogant about this thing and I was getting high on my own sort of arrogance, thinking, oh, I can do this, I can do that. But I've now learned that there are things in this life that you can't take on and beat. Now, this is a shot of Giant here and Ellie, and they're both fixing up in Ellie's kitchen. Now, the trouble with Giant was that he was also on other medication, and he went through a period of overdose, and every time he took a shot, he'd always overdose. Not because the gear was too much for him, but because of the other medication he was using as well. And not saying that this is the same day, but here's another photograph of him where he's overdosed. He's gone over. Right? He's taking too much. And this guy now is in the process of dying. Believe it or not, he's, in, he's, in, he's dying here, right? Now, uh, uh, that might sound very dramatic, but that is exactly what has happened. His body is breaking down. His body has not been able to manage. He can't cope with the drugs inside him. And he gets down to the bottom landing, and he just flaked out. And that's where he's totally collapsed. And there, believe it or not, his heart had stopped. Ellie has had to come down massage his heart, give him the kiss of life, get him on his feet, walk him up about, get him going, get him going again, get him going, bring him back to life. She brings him back to life, and he gets outside the front door and claps us again. And basically, if you put all these pictures in a line, this is giant overdosing. Now, this day, he was brought back to life again. This day, she followed him outside, she brought him back to life. So twice she's worked on him, she's worked on there, She's worked on him in there and she's brought the man back to life, right? And now he's dead because one day Ellie or whoever it was was not around to bring him back. The way I work is that I get as close, as close as I can to the story. I want, I want the whole story. I want people to react to this guy overdosing as, uh, in the same way that I reacted to him overdosing, right? But, I also want them to understand him as a human being, not just as a junkie. 
Because he wasn't just a junkie. He wasn't just... He isn't... Because none of these people are just junkies. None of them are just people who just do drugs. They're also human beings, right? We're all human beings, you know. But this is an aspect of their life that, for some reason, society has, has pushed aside to one side, to the extremes. So now these people live on the extremes because they've been criminalised through their illness, really. I'm not trying to shove this down people's throats. I'm not telling society anything, right? I'm not trying to say, look, you know, deal with it. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm doing is just photographing it and putting it out and saying, have a look at this. Consider it. Think about it. But for them to consider it, they've got to eat it, smell it, and get as close to it as I get close to it. After his first few months of research, Lanray decided to experiment with the drugs his subjects were taking. Everything I was doing was going around the drug. I was talking to the characters after they've done the drug. I was talking to the characters before they've done the drug. I was talking to the characters when they were affected by the drug. But I wasn't getting the drug itself. And the drug is central to the story. It is the drug story. But when I taste that drug, I now know what I'm writing about. I can now write about this thing in the first person from personal experience. Landry has now been addicted to heroin for five years and his book is nowhere near completion. At the beginning of the project, Landry stayed with Linda Murphy, with whom he previously had a long-term relationship. There's my child, there's my love child. The drug taking, she, um, she just didn't want to know about it. She was really disgusted with me about it. So was my son. In fact, most of my family were pretty disgusted with it, really, although they didn't really come down on me about it. Linda really did come down on me about it. I didn't think for a minute that they were going to use it. So I, didn't, I didn't see it point. I just thought maybe, we're, you know, we're mixing with people that were using it and, and seeing deals being done or whatever. But I didn't think they'd be using it. I didn't see any reason why I should use it. He's, he's taken stuff before, I know that's what it does. I don't, I don't see it point. Do you see it as part of the research for this project? No, I don't. I think that's a lot of crap when they say that they need to take it to, to feel, you know, get in and be the same. I don't see the point. I think, that's a lot, I think that's a load of bollocks. I think it's an excuse to take it. When Linda threw Lanray out, he moved in with some of the addicts he was documenting. Sarah, a voracious crack cocaine user, has become a central character in Lanray's book. So what work do you do, Sarah? I'm a prostitute. work on the beat in Bradford. Been working down there on and off for 10 years. And what do you do with the money you make? Um, it's obvious. <laughs> um, most of it goes on cocaine. Lanray initially interviewed Sarah to get some insight into the mechanics of buying drugs. We talk about drug deals and people write, but we don't really know what goes on in a drug deal, really. So I was going to find out what really went on in the drug deal, except, that, you know... Because before, I'd be honest with you, before that, I did try, I did try to follow drug dealers around, and it didn't work. I'd get bits of information, but then I'd be excluded from lots of stuff, and lots of stuff would go and be on my back. It wasn't enough, it just wasn't happening, so I started dealing. I'm not saying that because of that I deliberately said, OK, well, I'm going to have to do that myself, but I think that's what has happened somewhere along the line. As he took on the role of drug dealer, he became known to the police who raided his flat and arrested him several times. On one occasion, he narrowly avoided an eight-year sentence for dealing. Despite all this, he continued to record every detail of the story, which was increasingly becoming autobiographical. I had all this stuff stashed around the place, and and I had things in my mouth and, and I'd carry certain things with me. So when I got there, I could always deal with it. Any amount they wanted, I'd be able to do with it, so I'd do that. But every time they got inside the car, there'd always be a tape on somewhere, whether it's under the seat, underneath it, in the thing, where the hell it was, there's always a tape on somewhere so that when they got into the car, I could record this transaction going down. We used to have a bit of a laugh, really, because we didn't believe it, you know what I mean? Like, oh, if you're a journalist, then why are you uh, selling cocaine in Bradford? I think I was playing with it those days, you know, like... I don't know, I think I was playing with it, you know, I think... There was a bit of arrogance involved there. I got a buzz out of being the biggest dealer and the best dealer and, and the man. 
I think my drug addiction is my punishment, my payback for becoming a drug dealer. Lanoy's addiction has seriously impaired his ability to complete the project. With more than enough material to finish his book, he continues to stockpile his research and avoids the key task of trying to bring some order to the work. He wants to write his epilogue with the clarity of a drug-free perspective, but to do this he has to stop using drugs. He's gone through the trauma of cold turkey several times. And none of them worked. Except for one that worked a little bit, but then I thought, well, that's not really a cold turkey. I didn't really, you know, I just had a little sniffy nose for a few days and nothing serious. And if I, and when I mentioned it to a few people, they just laughed at me. Well, that's not cold turkey. What the hell was that sort of thing, right? So I, I thought, well, I guess I better do it all over again then. Lanray is trapped. He can't escape his addiction and is unable to complete his book. He's now truly living the lives of his subjects. I wanted to find out what the drug was about, so I went and checked out the drug. And then I became addicted, so I really did find out about the drug. And then I realised that this was too big for me. It, I, and then I became a heroin addict, and it was like, wow, what the hell's going on here? And that's when I felt like I was becoming a character in my own thing. I felt, I honestly felt, a, a, honestly, I'm not joking, but I honestly felt a bit like Tom and Jerry. I felt a bit like Mickey Mouse here, as if, like, you know, here I am a cartoonist, and I'm drawing myself in a cartoon. Here I am writing a story, and I'm becoming part of the story. Lanray is constantly reworking material he wrote years ago. My girl is in the bathroom doing her own thing. When she's finished, she comes back into the bedroom to assault me. But I'm so wasted, I can hardly lift myself up to the occasion. So nonchalantly, I throw an arm over the side of the bed, exposing my veins for her. But it's not enough. When you sit down and pay attention, she hisses at me through clenched teeth. And why don't you use a bloody tonic or something? She knows I hate this fucking ritual, I want nothing more to do with it, but she also knows that secretly I still crave the buzz, that all my protestations and promises to one day quit this bullshit are absolute non-starters. At the end of the day, I'm still just as, di- as addicted as I ever was. He has been trying to complete his book for five years, but is unable to find a publisher willing to take on his work. I need motivation, I need reason to be doing this, you know? I know why I'm doing it for myself, right? But it's becoming boring now, because I need someone to say to me, I'm, in, I'm into this, London. No, I mean, I want to be able to discuss the work, the job with somebody now. I want to get it sorted out. I want somebody on the case who's going to use the work. Why am I fucking doing this? Why am I doing it? I'm doing it for the same reasons I was doing it for fucking years ago. I'm still doing it years and years and years later for the same reasons. And I'm nowhere near getting this book published than I was in the first fucking place because nobody has taken it off my hands, so no one's prepared to take it up and say, yes, we'll go with this. And this is a deadline, and this is how long you've got left to do it in, and this is what, you know what I'm trying to say? There is none of that, and I need that now. Well, that's what I want now. And if I get that, I can finish it all within the next six months, I'll be finished. Lanray is working with his friend, journalist Neil McCormick. Together they are organising the chaos of his research material. In the past, they have collaborated on a few magazine articles about the world Lanray is now living in. These provided Lanray with the only income he has received from his journalism during this project. I, this. I remember I came up yeah. and you uh, met me at the station. Yeah. Took me up to the calf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> said, I'll just be five minutes and disappeared for three hours. I was the only white person in the place. I had a little notebook. I had no idea where I was. I didn't know where you lived. You know, I'd never been in you Bradford can't, before. Can't and I started writing my notebook and some guy just came over and took it off me. <laughs> Is that what you do? I had a look at it and then handed it back to me because I was writing poetry probably, yeah. And then you sent me down this lot here. We started with the Twilight Zone yeah, 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 and it has yeah, yeah. some interviews and it has a lot of stuff and I was gobsmacked. Really? Because the writing was good, the insight was great, the language was fantastic and, uh, and, uh, th- but, and also the content is savage. Savage. Great. But I mean, there's great phrases in here. There was one that jumped out. when You, you know that s- scene where you uh, went and dragged the girl off the street yeah, yeah, and she comes along all dressed up like a chilli pepper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just laughed. I mean, what a fucking great line that is. Sadie. Sadie. As Lanray slipped deeper into the drug world, he neglected his photography and concentrated on writing. Stories like Sadie, a description of how he stripped and searched a prostitute for the money she owed him, show him completely abandoning his role as observer. 
pale faced sailor with the mournful eyes, swinging down Manningham Lane hand in hand with a new boyfriend. She's all dressed up like a chili pepper, wearing red Adidas tracksuit bottoms and a white top stained pink in a washing machine. Her dark hair, as usual, is a thick, tangled mess, but there's something about its bounds. The way it blows freely in the wind. Something that makes my blood boil. She must have some money, otherwise, what the fuck is she doing on this time? So, tightening my grip on a steering wheel, I make a violent U-turn, screeching to a stop just inches away from her kneecaps. Then, glowering at the boyfriend, I bundle her into the back for a search. She's kicking and screaming like a fat pig, but I don't give a fuck. She owes me money and I want it. Simple. Then I'm right through her pockets as she's trying to get down the board. She's lifting up top. I grab hold of Sadie's top by the neckline and yank it off completely. Then the tracksuit bottoms, tights and knickers all in one movement. And there she is, naked. Her whole body exposed, tits, belly, thighs, all merged together in one great expanse of flesh, like a mountain of jelly quivering. She's just sitting there with a dull look of resignation in her eyes, as though something has been switched off from the inside. And now I'm beginning to feel doubtful, wondering why am I doing this anyway? Wondering how much more can be stripped away from this woman that she hasn't given up already? How much more violence can she endure? But stop, this is weak. You start thinking like that and questioning yourself. Doubting But you know, it's strange. Even as we're sinking, slipping and sliding in our own bullshit, we still feel the need to present ourselves. Something that restores our pride and stands us back up on our feet. So with that, I kick her out of the car and slam the door shut behind her, even before she's managed to dress herself properly. Then I'm gunning the motor away from her, my foot slammed down on the accelerator, skidding away, making a big show of it, watching Sadie through the rearview mirror spilling out onto the pavement, and wishing to God that I'd never spotted her in the first place. I did latch on to him because he had an access to a world and an insight into a world, this, this underworld that people don't know even exists. And, and uh, he could just walk straight into that. It's very rare, and there's very few um, journalists really that belong on that side of the, the, the fence. Oh, he's got to have regrets. If he finishes his book, maybe he won't have regrets because he'll have embarked on an adventure that ended up with a piece of art. If he doesn't, he'll regret for the rest of his life because he's thrown or he's incredibly charismatic and intelligent and strong and interesting individual who's led a life that has been an adventure. But you know, the adventure we, has to come to an end sometime for it to have meaning. During his addiction, Lanray lost sight of the project and slipped into a year-long drug void. He stopped taking photographs and made only a few fragmented diary entries. I'm glad you come round to ask me about it because it's um. You like talking about that after? Well, yeah, because it's good. Because He's now tracking down and interviewing some of the key characters of that time. Ray, who appears in Lanray's book as the piss artist, is a methadone addict who used to sell Lanray his urine. Before we get to the money, I was thinking about the, the urine. You know, for mm. instance. Yeah. I come to you, you come to my house, we do a little methadone deal, say, for instance. I yeah. Guess you get some extra methadone, I get some extra money. I might go and buy heroin or whatever it is with that money, right? Right. But at the same time, you give me a urine sample as well, right? Yeah. So I put the urine, I, you, the urine sample you've given me, which is uh, a relatively clean urine sample. People who are on a methadone prescription need to present a clean urine sample, but some of them still use opiates on top. So to fool the doctor, you've got to get a urine sample that has methadone, but no heroin in it. And Ray is perfect because he doesn't use heroin, but he uses methadone. Yeah. But there was a period, wasn't there? I mean, there was a period at Elaine's house, at my house, where it was, I mean, maybe not a lot of people, but you were, you were asked frequently for urine sample. Yeah, well, I was living in the middle of it. I mean, I was living at uh, number eight, Marlborough Road, wasn't I? Right. I mean, it's a nerve centre, really. It was a focal point. Like, when you were uh, they they knew all had to push button five and uh, number eight, and if Ray was in, it'd piss in the bottle for him. <laughs> <laughs> to put it crudely. Ray, how many times did you have to piss in the bottle? That's what I'm asking. If I had a, a pound for every time, I wouldn't be scumped. 
Lanre is working harder on his book than he has been for years. He desperately wants to return to the life he had before heroin. You knew Lanre as, as a photographer or before he was a photographer? Before he was a photographer, when he was a, a wild boy. And what I was so proud of him was is that, that um, everybody at police and everything had just classed him as a no hope and then he went he went to jail and he got and he come out and he started to do some go to college and do his photography and he were good. And I was proud of him. He were a good role model then for people. You know, for young ones. You know, and he's really good he's, he were naturally good with kids. I mean, I'm talking about him as if he's dead, but to me, it's, it's like he's dead, because he's not, he's not the person that he was. And he could go anywhere, the advantage he had, he could go anywhere and take any kind of photographs, because he had that way with people. People felt comfortable with him. And I just think he's at a place where he, he's, you know, is it, he's gonna be either dead or in jail. which isn't very good for Femi, is it? I mean, he's an embarrassment for Femi. Femi's embarrassed about him now. And I think that's what hurts Femi, more than Oaks. He used to be proud of his dad. He used to show off about his dad. Lanray and his son haven't spoken for over a year. Femi is angered and hurt by his father's actions. He's a bit pissed off because, one, because I didn't go to him and tell him myself about it. And second, well, because, and also, one, because I hid it from him. And second, because I didn't tell him the complete or the exact truth about it when he asked me about it, right? So I have to explain all that to him and clear the air and allow him to be a little bit annoyed still and I have to allow him to, that to work, for him to work through that. It will come out good in the end, I know it will. Well, when I say good, it will come out okay in the end. Lanre is beginning the slow process of rebuilding a relationship with his son. I really pray to God that we are very tight with each other. You know, I want to, you know, I love him to death, though. I really hope that we're going to be as tight as whatever we can be, you know. Jesus, talk about getting nervous, man. Something just came out from nowhere and he was on. If he's got to face anybody in the world, he's got to face his own child. He can't run away from his own child, and that's what he's doing. Even if his own child sits there and sees him taking it, at least he's, he's, he's doing it. He's, it's open, isn't it? But it's all this under... I think that's what Femi finds frustrating because he's never talked to him about it or admitted it to him. <laughs> she always she, gets she's waving downstairs, right? I think your dad was nervous as well for me. Oh, well, yeah. I oh, was a little, yeah. Oh, because you just suddenly appeared from the yeah, well, actually, you were getting closer and closer to <laughs> <and> ring the heart. <laughs> <laughs> just appeared from nowhere, you know. It was good. I enjoyed that. It was all good. It was all good. I had faith in you, though. One character who doesn't appear in the book but has been part of Landray's life throughout this ordeal is his stepson, Jason. Jason is living with his mother Linda and also struggling with his own heroin addiction.
<laughs> he suddenly needs a cuddle. He's got hairs on his chest, but he needs a fucking cuddle. A drug addict can't help another drug addict to get off drugs when they're still using the cell. But I th I, I, uh, at the end of the day, he's my dad, and I think he could have helped me a little bit more. I don't hold that against him, do you know what I mean? I don't know. Right fucking family, are we? Adam's family. Hello. Hello. Hi, is that Shelley Stewart? Speaking. Oh, great. It's um, Landry Fane Toller here. Hi, how Hi. are you? I just thought I'd phone in and, and sort of introduce myself and see how things are going. Well, it's good to hear from you. How are That's things? good. I'm, I'm Landry has finally found a literary agent. He's hoping that she'll find a publisher for his book. Today, in fact, um, they should come back to me early next week sometime. OK. Um, obviously, I got into some problems in, in, this, in this project myself. But I'm out of that project, out of those problems, and I'm now wanting to get this project sort of wrapped up. And no, I do understand from your point of view that it's that it's a focus and that it, it's sort of you know. Yeah. It just pisses me off when he fucking goes on about his book, and it's all going to be different when he gets his book, and he's going to do this when his book's done, and that when his book's done. But what, what until his book's done? Sitting in this fucking dump. Sticking fucking needles in your arm, that's... Do you know what I mean? And then, when, what if his book does, does go big and he's got loads of money? But if he's here, then we know exactly where that money's going to go. Now then, PC caller. Hello, how are you? Right. While Lanray is making progress with his addiction, Jason is going downhill. Linda's solution is to send him to Jamaica to stay with her relatives. It's a decision Lanray disagrees with. Do you honestly believe that if you go to Jamaica, you'll sort yourself out? Yeah, because I'm away from heroin, that's what I need to get away from. What happens when you come back to Bradford? Or when you come back to heroin? I'm on about staying there. For good, living there? For right? good, yeah. You can go to Jamaica and get involved in another bullshit in Jamaica, thinking that you're getting rid of the heroin problem. You might forget the heroin problem in Jamaica and pick up another fucking lot of crap in Jamaica. The fact of it is, are you dealing with yourself? You're not dealing with yourself in Jamaica. What the fuck is in Jamaica? And I went to Landry, didn't I, when I, when, when I knew that Jason was taking it and asked him if he could go stay there, like, you know, thinking it was going to do some good. And Landry didn't believe me when I told him that Jason was taking it. And so then Jason went to stay there with him and he ended up worse. I'm sick yeah, but to death of destroying my mum. That's what I'm sick of. What do you mean? Look, see. You That's don't bullshit. agree? That's no, not... it's not bullshit. Of course it is. Right, because but... I love my mum and I'm sick of fucking destroying my mum. Jason. And I don't want to have a nervous breakdown. Do you don't it. agree with it. It's got nothing so to do you're... you're not even being honest with yourself. It's got nothing to do with, I'm sick of hurting my fucking mother. You're sick of heroin. You're sick of hurting yourself. You're sick of having a non fucking productive life. You're sick, you're sick, you're sick. Yes, I fully understand that. Heroin for you is causing you nothing but grief. Yes? Nothing to do with your mother. It is nothing to do with your mother, Jason, right? And I sincerely and honestly do understand what you're talking about, right? I do understand. The reason we're raising our voices, right, the reason we're raising our voices about it is because we're passionate about it. The reason we're passionate about it, Jason, is because we really believe it and it's the truth, right? And it's about time we get these fucking truths out, right? But let me tell you, son, I'm telling you, honest to God, right? You and Femi are the greatest things I've ever had in my life. I would never, ever, ever in my life lead you the wrong way. I swear to God, I would never. I would die first before I did anything like that to you, too. I swear to you, right? I'm telling you, Jason, going to Jamaica, going to Spain, going anywhere to get away from heroin is non-productive. You've got a heroin problem, but still other things have got to go on. So you've got to deal with this thing whilst the other things are going on. But at the moment, Jason, all the other things around you have collapsed. This is what's getting you down. All the things around you have collapsed. The family's getting pissed off about you, all these different things, but not just about heroin, many other things, right? But everything else around you has collapsed. So all I'm simply saying is that why don't you spend time rebuilding those things around you? Why don't you get a job? Why don't you go to college? Why don't you find out what exactly it is you really want to do? Lannery. After Lanray's failures to go cold turkey, he decides to take the slower road to withdrawal. With the help of his drugs counsellor, he's transferring his drug addiction from heroin to methadone. How are you? This prescribed drug can be controlled and gradually reduced. 
The last two urines have both had heroin and cocaine in. Yeah. The one before that had dihydrocodeine on top of prescribed medication. Because obviously the computer tells it. So it's becoming, the, it, it that, had become a pattern. Yeah, I didn't realise that. I didn't know. And it takes you to take stock of, since I've had this prescription, whereas I used to use four times a day, yeah. I now use once a week. Yeah. But we need to eliminate the usage, well. because once you've had a habit, Lannery, yeah. you know, at some point you'll be off. And once you've had a habit, all it, you only have to have one toot. So once I've had a habit, even if I... You can't play with it. I just, right, OK. You can't ever play I with it. I, I don't, in, to be honest with you, I don't intend to play with it. I really don't intend. And I do really sincerely intend to get away from this thing. Des desperately want to get away from it, right? But it's just that it's just difficult, that's all. It really is hard. I mean, I think an option, rather than saying, right, let's go back up on the methadone, is the possibility of giving you a few dihydrocodeine a day, DF118. That might be an idea. I was going to, cause I, I, I was going to ask you what to do about that. What do I do? Because, to be honest, I didn't want to say, well, look, so if I stop using everything else, if I don't use on top at all, and I just stick to my 25 mils, and if it's not quite enough, I didn't want to come and say, can I go up to 30? Because I think that's going backwards. I mean, I can give you a... A, say three 30 milligram DFs, and yeah. maybe you take those in the evening That's so okay. that when you're feeling a little bit That's sniffly, great. your aches are starting, you've not set yourself up to feel like you've failed by having to go back up to 30 That's mil. Right. And that would be a purely That's temporary great. measure That's to, to make you feel, to enable you to yeah. feel comfortable. That's perfect. That is actually perfect. The painkiller Sue has given Lanray are to provide the extra help he needs each time she reduces his methadone. She's actually sorted out my fears, my fear of not having enough methadone to sustain me through the day. Everything's coming together now, you know, the book's coming together, the agents come together, the film is coming together, and now my heroin news has come together so that I can stop heroin and just deal with methadone and gradually reduce off the methadone. I've got enough now in a day to last me, and that's great. Femi and Lanray are beginning to see each other again. Is it five in it? Lanray needs Femi to understand his past actions and hopes to regain his son's trust. There'll be times I'd stop, I'd get off it for a bit, you know what I mean? I'd stop for a while, I'd take methadone and that. And, and every time I used to see you, I used to be on methadone when I used to see you. And when you used to say to me, Dad, is it true, are you using this? And I'd say, no, I'm not using it, right? I think I only lied to you once. I did lie yeah. to you once, right? But it was only once I lied. OK, let me, I'll, I'll try and explain. That's what I got, that's when I will start getting, not coming to meeting you and stuff. Really? And no, when you said to me, no, I'm not, and I thought, yeah, you are, and then... Really? So I got mad then. Did you, how did you feel? What did you feel like? I got mad because you, you told me that you want, and I thought... It... Was it the lines that got to Yeah. Lines? So if I said to you, yes, I am using, what would you have said? How would you have felt? It would been better because I know you want bullshit into me then. I'm sorry about things like that. I really am sorry about you, because I don't use drugs anymore. You know that, don't you? You don't really know that. No, yet. no. Okay. Be honest with me. You don't know that yet, do you? No. Okay, well, I'm gonna be honest and honest, honest with you. I've not used anything completely. I'm not not anything because I use methadone. I, I use methadone. That's it's still a drug if you know what I'm saying, but it's coming away from it, right? Because you know you can't just stop. Yeah. Like that, right. But I can say that for three solid weeks now, I've not used anything at all properly, right? And I don't intend to use anything. Else, yeah. Right. And that's the tr truth, now. I really fucked up. I really screwed up over Easter. They closed the they closed the place down. The, the doctor's office and all that were closed down over Easter. I went to get my script, and the fucker were closed. I got my script. I took it to the chemist, and they weren't there. And so all Easter, I've gone without nothing. Nothing at all. This is just to get me straightened up. I haven't lost it. I promise you that I haven't fucking lost it. It's just that four days of agony. No sleep for four days. This is true, and I'm not bullshitting you. I won't tell you no lies. For four days, I haven't slept. I was fucked. Can't even hold myself up. It's a good job you didn't see me a minute ago, because I was, I was crying. I was, well, not crying, but tears were falling out of my head. Snot was coming down my fucking nose. I had to walk to the phone box. It took me half an hour just to get to the bloody phone box. But I don't know if it was 
my fault, or the chemist's fault. I guess it was my fault because, I mean, I didn't pick up, but the chemist just wasn't there. I went there to the chemist to get it sorted and it just fucked up. I don't understand why wasn't my chemist there. He knows, he's shot, he knows, but anyway. Let me just get this in me and I'll be all right then. Lanway's hit of heroin will only keep him pain-free for the next eight hours. I can't last from now until Monday. Today's only Wednesday. I've still got like five, six days to go. I don't think I'll have to last. I don't think I'll last five or six days on a little bit I've had this morning. So if I don't get anything else, if I don't get any methadone or anything like that before now and then, I've got a feeling I'm going to have to use again. And I don't want to use, I really don't want to. But I'd rather do that. I would rather, rather, rather do that than to, um, than to go without, because I can't cope with this going without thing. I can't cope with it on its own. I just can't cope with the withdrawals at the moment. I don't want to use drugs for the whole week. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to do that. I've got to try and find... Um, I don't know anybody even, but I've got to try and find somebody with methadone. If I, can find, if I can find somebody who's got methadone, then maybe I can buy a little bit off them, do you know what I mean? And to last me until a week. The only way he can get hold of methadone is to go back to his old dealers. But the thing is, I don't know anybody who uses method. I don't know anybody who has methadone for sale like that. Fucking hell. It's ridiculous, this is. Lanray managed to find a dealer with methadone and avoided resorting to heroin. He is back on his methadone prescription and has almost halved his dosage. I don't normally do it in the street like this, right? But I'll just take a little sip now because I'll just measure it out because, you know, I only take something like seven mils twice a day, right? So I'll just measure a little bit out. I'm actually supposed to take seven mils, so I, but I, what I usually do, I take five mils. So I'm, I'm trying to... Um, I'm trying to push myself a little bit by taking less than I need to take, or that I'm supposed to take. So, there it is, it's only a, a silly, horrible looking green stuff, but that's all I take. Just that little bit like that, twice a day. That's it. That's the job done. That is supposed to keep me active and fit now, until I go to bed. Since Lanray has stopped using heroin, he's starting to pull back from this world. He keeps in touch with the characters in his book via Sarah, who's living in his front room after leaving her boyfriend. I just can't stand being around all these people anymore. I don't want to... It's not my life, this at all. I know I've fitted, I, I have fit very well into this. I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm quite amazed at how well I have fit into all of this, right? In fact, I've probably, I'm probably living now in exactly the same way as they all live, right? But okay, I'm kind of um, 
I'm kind of pleased with myself about that, actually, that I've, I feel as if I've done a job well done here, right? But it, it really isn't my life at all, I swear, it's not my life. And, like, so I need to get out of here now. Finally, after seven long years, Lanray has his first hope of getting his work published. His agent, Shirley, has arranged a meeting with an editor showing a keen interest in the book. slightly uh, uneasy about your role in your own book. You, you yeah. say you're a journalist. I mean, that's not as interesting as, oh, no. as you becoming a drug dealer. Yeah. That's fascinating, that whole yeah. book. I mean, I'd really yeah. like to know a lot about that. Okay. You becoming a drug addict, uh -huh. you know, uh, I don't get high in your own supply, yeah. but you do. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's you, what, yeah. You, you just keep sliding. Because oh, yeah. it's full of contradictions, isn't it? It's really yeah. strange. Though. Yeah, absolutely. Right, okay. That, that's interesting. Um, and how you get out of that. Right. It's like beginning, middle and end. That yeah, aspect. sure. You have, you have a shape there. Yeah. But your, your role in that story... Yeah, is, I, I don't explore that enough. Yourself, no, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you're clear in your own mind about your role in that story. Because I never set out, none of us set out. Or every, in every book I've read about drugs, they always say, I never set out to be a drug dealer or a drug addict. Right. And it's true, nobody yeah. really does set out to do yeah. it. Nobody has an ambition to be a drug no, addict, right? In a way, you, you, you lost your, your status as an, as, a, as an observer, yeah. becoming a participant. That's right. That in itself is a, is a very interesting yeah. process. Yeah. What happened and why? And, yeah. and, I mean, did you get involved because you, you felt you, you weren't close enough to the material? or? I couldn't just I couldn't say that Michael Smith was a drug addict and he'd done that he'd done this because it, it didn't it just didn't mean anything to me never mind anybody else mm. so I guess I just had to try and find out but that's like I said that's typical of me though yeah. that really is yeah your your anger I mean I, 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 I can't sense where that comes from because it seems like your your parents were fairly fairly normal fairly straight if you like but, but they they they, <laughs> they did some strange things right we right. had a very strange upbringing right a very strange upbringing because the way they were i mean the nigerian way of doing things the very strict way of doing things is something that we're just not into at all for some reason that's also very interesting i mean so, again yeah. it doesn't have to be sort of a major part of the book but perhaps sure. part of the introduction to give some backstory to what happened next that's that's true yeah but I mean, because i think this is the reason why i get involved in these stories yeah, like yeah. i really do i really think that i really think this is why i think i think you know this this self-discovery thing at this age. I mean, I'm 40 years old now, for goodness sake. I should probably have got over these things. <laughs> Not necessarily. Well, you know, I don't know, but, you know, I, you know. <laughs> well, you've led an extraordinary life. <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> this is the longest period that Lanray has been without heroin during his addiction. But the drug continues to be part of his life. Sarah is unable to inject herself and still depends on Lanray to do this for her. It's full of shit again, isn't it? No, it's not. It's just, well, it just needs a bit more. Citrine? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not too bad. Look at that. It's cleaned up now. Oh, go, go on. Get, get in. Get in. Come on, Murray. Get in. Always be patient. Should you go and be patient? Does it look good, too good on camera for you to be saying, get it in, get it in, get it in? When <laughs> <laughs> you say, get it in, get it in, you sound like a real junkie here now, so it's just... Come you know. like, on, you know it. It's a shove, then. <laughs> Just go wherever you want. Fuck off. Someone's got to get that. Well, I can't get it. You can't get it. Oh. No, 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 you can't. Just do this. Miss that one. So let me just tell him whoever's got the way, then I can sort of, then I can concentrate. Then I can concentrate. You missed that on purpose. I can't remember, I can't That's feel it. On, just show me what it is, just show me what it is. Is it here? Right. Just missed it. Can't feel nothing now, I swear to you. Unless you can find it. How about ah. you? Don't take, take your time. I can't. What about, <laughs> one, what about one of the other arms? There isn't, there's no veins nowhere, Henry. There just isn't. They're fucked. Totally. Well, you've got it. Not properly, though. I don't care. It's not got properly, Sarah. Oh, it's filling. It's not filling. You can tell it's not filling. This is why you get your big lumps in your arm. I'm 
bump that one there. Okay, let's put your foot back down. If you press it, go on your neck, I think it's on your neck. That one, there's one, there's only one. Yeah, just keep still, let me have a look, because I'm doing it. Have you been in your leg before? No, yeah, there, you can see where I've been, that one vein. There? That might hurt, Sarah. You're not bothered. I've got that. Coops, I don't mind. I'll get it. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. This is no good one. Keep still. Keep still. Keep still. Keep still. I don't really like going in my foot apart from that one vein there. Go oh, hang tight. Hang tight. Because you're not going to get it nowhere else apart from this, will you? What's the other arm? It's the other arm. What about this? You're not going to get in anywhere here, are you? I don't fucking believe this. I've finished it in my head, it's not there now. I've moved on, I've, I've, I'm, I've, I'm me now. I'm right. more or less back to what I was before. So I keep on seeing it as a job, as a job done. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So, although it hasn't quite finished yet, but it is for me now a job done. I'm, I'm almost ready in my head to start, I mean, I'm already thinking of other jobs now, looking at other ideas, what to do. I'm just trying to wrap this one up now. I'm just waiting for my publisher to say, yes, I'm publishing. Yes, come and sign. Yes, the film's going ahead. And just to tail off. And then, great, once that's done, I'll finish off what I've got to do and then move on. Lanray has been waiting for a reply from the publisher for four weeks. Hello? Hello, Shirley. Speaking. Lanray, Shane Toller here. Hi, how are you? Hi. <laughs> how are you? Not so bad. Um, and I talked to... My wife has been away on holiday since... That's right. Has it, has it, has it, is he back yet, do you know? He has just come back. Oh, so he just come back now? Yeah, he just came back and I spoke to him last night. Right. He would like to do it. He wants to do it? He would like to do it. Uh, no, he wants to do it as a paperback original, so that sort of by definition means that it's a pretty modest offer that they're making. That was very good. Well, um... Everything is going according to plan, believe it or not. I've got a publisher. <laughs> yes! Fucking hell.